today we're going to be talking about if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter how fast you get there. And when I go speak with companies and organizations and developers and operators and executives, we want to start doing everything better and faster and stronger and secure and more reliable and awesome. Like, who's heard this about a million times? Yes. OK, who, who are the devs in the house? Who are the ops in the house? Who's management and executives? <coughs> yeah. OK, we all want to do the thing, right? Because who, like, who wants to be awesome? All of us. Who wants to suck at things? OK, good. <laughs> Trick question. I was like, who's just raising their hands? Because <laughs> this is the exercise. We want to do everything better because we got into this because tech is exciting and fun and we get to make things and be creative and watch, like, watch the lights light up and do hello world and, and make things awesome. But it's tough when we aren't necessarily sure what that means. Right? Except also sometimes that's great because we understand and we're the experts and we know what that looks like. So how? How is it that we do this? So that's what we get to talk about today. Where are we going? How do we actually improve performance? And how tricky is that word, right? Performance is a, is a tough one. How do we make it a carrot and not just a stick? How should we measure it? Why should we actually care? And, and then at the end, kind of like, what is this culture thing, and how do we actually measure it so that we can then make it better? So let's start with where are we going? Who here's heard of maturity models? Do we know what maturity models are? I'm so excited. So who's not heard of a maturity model? Do we want a real quick recap? Do we want to recap anyway? OK, so maturity models are this wonderful thing that help explain like where we are, and they're usually like predefined levels. By the way, they're usually made up by someone trying to sell us something. They all go to level five. Do we know why they go to level five? Most of them go to level five? Because <laughs> we all have five fingers. <laughs> it's true. It's true. OK. Um, who here has played World of Warcraft? Fine. Who here has a friend who's played World of Warcraft? Yes. OK, here we go. When World of Warcraft first came out, uh, this was like the, the land, right? So even if, you have, even if only your friends have played, we all like get this, right? It's a map. Um, when it first came out, it went to like level 60. You could like roll a bunch of characters. You could create a bunch of characters. <laughs> I just said, roll. clearly I played World of Warcraft. Clearly I had to stop playing World of Warcraft because I had to finish like work and school and jobs and stuff. Um, you could be like a mage or like all this cool stuff. Uh, it went to level 60. You could have a bunch of tools. You could have a bunch of technologies. So let's create ourselves a maturity model. How do we feel about this? Let's pretend we're executives. Let's create a maturity model. How do we feel about this? Yay! OK. Y'all are my people. This is great. OK. So, but we don't have very much time. So our maturity model is only going to go to level three. So first level is going to be level good, and we're going to like conquer land on the left. Second maturity model is going to be level, uh, and it'll go to level 40. Sounds good. OK, second level is going to be level great, and it'll be all of the land on the left and half the land on the right, and we'll go to level 50. Uh, third level will be called level amazing, and we will conquer, conquer all of the lands. Sound good? Yay, OK, so we progress, we all move forward, we've conquered all the lands, um, and at the end of this exercise, what happens? We get a gold star on our forehead. Everyone, gold star on our forehead. Participate. Gold star on our forehead. We collect our fat bonus check, and we pay our consultants. Congratulations. OK, um, now let's fast forward several years, and what happens? This is now the land in World of Warcraft. The land has changed. The landscape has changed. By the way, you can now go to level 110. The technology has changed. 
the competition has changed. Y'all, you can have pets now. Does anyone care that we got our gold star on our forehead and we got to level 60? If we go out and try to fight, what's going to happen? We're going to get our butts kicked. Our competition has changed. Our customers' expectations have changed. And like, this is a fun, silly example and story, but it's also very relevant for technology, right? So the challenge with maturity models particularly as we talk about developing and delivering technology and features for customers, whether they're internal end users or external end users, is that it doesn't help us actually address what matters. Ooh, that was some magical forwarding. They tell us that we're done when we reach a predefined destination, and the whole rest of the world keeps addressing and answering what matters and what's important. They also tell us, and leaders, to stop dedicating resources once we've arrived. By the way, resources aren't just money. It's time, it's attention, it's education, it's training, it's paying attention to what our customers need and want. They also tell us that we all follow the exact same path to success. Remember our super fun made up maturity model? It said that we had to explore that land in the exact same order. Now, if we think about this in terms of technology transformation, getting our teams better, faster, delivering, think about the organizations that we're in right now. Think about all the teams that are working on and delivering technology. Do they all look the same? Probably not. So their next step forward, will it look exactly the same? Probably not. And the next step, and the next step, and the next step. Again, probably not. So how do we expect a step-by-step-by-step -step -step map and prescriptive path to make sense for something that's so complex? Now, maturity models tell us that technology is a checklist to just be completed. And when we're done, we're done, and we move on to something else. But we got into this game because it's fun, and it's exciting, and we get to keep discovering what's new. Now listen, I, I understand, I fundamentally understand why maturity models are good and why they're comforting is because it, it lets me get that someone else has been where I've been and that they know what comes next. But if, if they point me too far into the future, that's, that's not helpful. Okay, so <laughs> thanks, Nicole. You just like brought down the room, sad trombone. So how do we actually get there? What's helpful? What's helpful is to focus on a constraint. And by constraint, I basically just mean, like, what's holding me back? What's the hurdle for each team? Focus on that, fix it, execute well and completely. I make it sound simple. It's not. I know it's a challenge. But that's also why we rely on our expertise and on our experts and also on our community. One thing I really, really love about the DevOps movement that I've seen over the last decade is that we really rely on each other to move forward. OK, so then where are we going? A direction is helpful. I didn't say we have to fly blind. We should know at least what direction we should be facing. OK, so then what direction is that? And the number one question I get so often is, is there one metric that matters? Can anyone guess the right answer here? No, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead and tell all your executives that. No, there's not. But if I have to pick something, this would be it. It would be software delivery performance. And it's not one metric, but it is four of them. And they tend to hang out together. 
they all go drink tea together and they have a little knitting circle and they chill and they throw darts. Now here's what I mean when I say software delivery performance. I mean some throughput and stability measures. Throughput is speed. So I'm talking about deployment frequency, how often you push code. I'm also talking about lead time for changes. Code commit to code running in production. And then I'm talking about stability. Stability is time to restore service and change fail rate. Now, someone challenged me earlier this week, and I really appreciate her doing that, because she said, why are you only focusing on things that are easy to measure? Now, really quickly, I'd say these aren't necessarily easy. But she had a really fantastic point, because there are so many things that are important, and why are you focusing on this? I'm not focusing on this at the exclusion of other things like culture and people and quality. But this is important for a few things. First of all, this focuses on the performance of software delivery. And notice that I'm measuring things that are in tension. So often, people have told us that we can't have both speed and stability, right? Has anyone heard that for things to be stable or safe, we have to slow down? Yeah, right? We've kind of heard this. It's been whispered in dark alleys, right? We've found over five years of research and 30,000 data points, these actually move together. And when I say move together, I mean I take all these data points. Do we want like a stats tangent really quick? Can I stats start out for a second? OK, yes, OK. I take all the data points and I throw them in the hopper. Very technical term, throw it in the hopper. Um, and I do a cluster analysis, which means I want to see how they cluster together. So I see them all like kind of grouped together in statistically meaningful ways and then a gap, so they're statistically different from another group. And then a group, and then a gap, and then a group. <laughs> I'm real creative, so I call them high performers and medium performers and low performers. <laughs> but what that means, when they group together, I'm seeing the speed and stability measures move together. The high performers are doing everything well. The medium performers, like, we're seeing like the middle group hang out together, and <laughs> some people are like on the struggle bus together down at the bottom. We see movement together. There aren't trade-offs. I think that's important. So if you walk away with only one thing, have it be that. Speed and stability are possible together. Okay. So then what's, what's next? Some people wonder, where they might fall. This is my eye chart. Sorry, it's real small. This comes from the 2018 Accelerate State of DevOps report. So when we take this very data-driven approach, where do people fall? We see elite performers. So this is the highest group. The high performers can push code on demand. Lead time for changes, again, code commit to code running in production less than an hour. It's getting it all the way through your pipeline. Time to restore service, again, less than an hour. Do you know what makes me super excited about that? That means that when you have an emergency, something breaks, your regular process looks very, very much like your emergency process. You're not skipping tests. Everything goes through. Change fail rate. It's between 0 and 15%. And by the way, historically, that actually looks very close to the 2, 3, 5% mark. Compare that to our low performers. These are median numbers, so we do have a range here. We see deploy frequency between once a week and once a month. Lead time for changes between one month and six months. Time to restore service between one week and one month. This is where we're seeing a difference, right? And then our change fail rate is between 46 and 60%. Now, if you take a look at this, you think about where your team might fall. If you don't see yourself on this chart, don't be discouraged. So often, I'll get people contact me and they'll say, but I'm not here. This isn't my industry. It doesn't apply. First of all, it, all industries are represented. Highly regulated fields show up in elite performers. Crazy cowboy startups are in low performers. We're everywhere. But don't be discouraged because everyone can achieve high performance. We just need to start working. And everyone can do it. We can all work together and get there. OK. But how, right? How do we get there? One does not just walk into high performance. 
So how do we get there, right? DevOps, or you know, whatever you want to call it, technology transformation, whatever, whatever your leadership team likes, just do your little find and replace. It's a cross-functional community dedicated to building, evolving, and operating secure, resilient systems at scale. It can include so many job titles, tasks, and roles, but I think the part that's important is that we work together, we automate, we reduce toil, and we deliver value for whoever our end users are. So this is a summary of my research over the last five years. And right now, everyone is like, what? <laughs> Girl. So let's think of it this way. We have a cultural aspect. We have a tooling and automation aspect. And we have some process. It really breaks down into these things. OK, we, we can manage this, right? We feel OK? We can, have we heard culture is important? OK. We can do culture. We <laughs> we're at a tech conference. Tell me that we've heard that tooling is important. <laughs> OK, we're good here. And process, right? We need some OK. OK, now we're back. Here's what we see. Um, so technical practices and continuous delivery, that's at the bottom. We're going to break this down. By the way, anytime you see an arrow, this is a predictive relationship. Uh, lean management and lean product development, these are going to be some processes. This arrow, see this SDO performance? That's our speed and stability and availability. OK, so all of these like, lead into this stuff. Uh, a quick like, tangent in the middle, outsourcing's bad. Who's surprised? <laughs> no one's surprised. OK, good. Um, cloud infrastructure helps. That's a huge driver. PS, if you do it right. Um, the things I love about culture, we can see autonomy helps drive culture. Western organizational culture, we'll talk about. It drives job satisfaction. Look down here at the bottom. Identity, if we really love our work. Smart investments, decrease burnout, decrease deployment pain, decrease rework. In SRE land, we call this toil, right? We're decreasing toil. And it helps us with organizational performance. And at the very, very back, at the very far left, we see transformational leadership. Has anyone here had a really, really great leader, manager, mentor, someone in the organization, or even just like a really dope team lead that somehow made your work amazing, and you were somehow kicking out way more work than you ever did before? Yeah. So this makes sense, right? Because their influence flows through and magnifies and amplifies all the work. OK. So it looks crazy, but it all does boil down to culture and tooling and process. And we've got some great evidence to help us point to what to look for. Now again, though, sometimes people will look at this and they're like, where do I even start? This is like 37 things. Let's think back. Identify your constraint. What's your team's biggest hurdle? Focus there. Start there. Eliminate that constraint. So in, in theory of constraints, we call that elevating the constraint. Once it's no longer the, the thing that's in your way, focus on the next constraint. OK. Now, the next big question I get is, how do I measure performance? The biggest mistakes I often see are these, focusing on outputs versus outcomes, the difference between individual and local measures versus team and global measures. So let's look through some examples here. Uh, lines of code. This is the best example I have for outputs versus outcomes. It's funny because sometimes I bring this up as an example, and so often people are like, lines of code? Who still gets asked about lines of code? I get asked about lines of code every, at least every month, almost every other week. So lines of code is dumb. And here's the best examples. Sometimes people are like, well, more lines of code is going to be good. More lines of code is not good. Who already knows this? We all already know this. See, y'all my people, this is a smart room. 
because, right, more code just gives us more to maintain, right? Bloated software, slows things down, higher maintenance costs, higher costs of change. Maybe less is better. But like, who has seen this ridiculous thing where like, someone comes up with this, right, exactly, the immediate hand, <laughs> where someone comes up with this amazingly, amazingly clever one line of code that two weeks later, like, no one can read, no one can interpret. We have no idea what happened. Sometimes the best answer is to delete code, right? Or change a business process so that you don't need code. Lines of code just is not a great proxy for things. It's, it's difficult, right? That's an output. It's a measure of an output. But it doesn't tell us what we accomplished. By the way, that's why we focus on software delivery performance, right? Because that's, it's at the end. OK, so let's talk about velocity then. So for some background, when we're in agile land, problems, we break problems down into stories, which then we assign points, and we estimate effort to complete these. We're all familiar with this, right? OK, great. Um, at the end of the sprint, uh, we assign, or the total points are signed off by the customer. This is velocity. By the way, velocity is a capacity planning tool. We shouldn't be using this to measure productivity. Over the years, teams have often used this to measure productivity. But it's not great as a measure of productivity, and here's why. Velocity is a relative measure. It's not an absolute measure. It's relative to the team, to the tasks they're doing, to the context that they're working in. We should never be comparing teams on their velocity. We can also game it by inflating estimates, which is understandable, right? We want to make sure that we hit our targets. This last point is the most important, though. We want to be, again, thinking about outcomes. What's the goal? What are the teams working on? If I'm working on a team and I have points that I want to accomplish and you're working on a team and you have something that you want to accomplish, what happens if there's something that needs to be accomplished for the entire organization that requires us working together? I'm not going to help you. I got points I got to finish. <laughs> so we want to be thinking about outcomes, not outputs. Finally, utilization. Utilization is good, but only up until a point, because more isn't necessarily better. It doesn't allow for slack. And we all know that we always have unplanned work, right? And if anything, when people come back to me and they debate this point, I'll just point back to math. Q theory tells me that as utilization approaches 100%, lead times approach infinity. Once we hit higher and higher and higher levels of utilization, your teams take longer to get work done. I can think about this myself. The longer my to-do list gets, the, the longer it takes me to get anything done, right? OK. Now, why, why should we care about any of this? Why do we care? Why do we care about delivering software faster? Why do we care about it being faster and more stable? Here's why. Teams that deliver more often, when I compare those elite performers and those low performers, we see 46 times more frequent code deployments, over 2,500 times faster from commit to deploy, seven times lower change fail rate, and over 2,600 times faster time to recover from incidents. It lets us get our features to customers faster. It lets us recover from downtime. It lets us patch faster. We can get out our compliance and regulatory changes better and faster. It also makes it just easier and safer to push our code. Let's just get back to the fun part of what it is that we do. It also helps us contribute to the organization, whether that means money, commercial goals, productivity, profitability, market share or non-commercial goals, because we care about more than just the bottom line. We care about things like effectiveness, efficiency, and customer satisfaction. And I really love the shift that we've been seeing in the broader industry over the last several years to things like corporate social responsibility. 
and we know that delivering software better helps us achieve these goals. And for bonus points, we also see that elite performers, the highest performers, see 50% higher market cap growth over the previous three years. Now, as a little asterisk, that analysis was only available for those companies that are publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, why else do we care? This also contributes to quality. We see high performers are able to do more new work. Now, what do I mean by new work? They don't have to do as much rework or unplanned work. We get to do more novel work, more fun development. Now, when I say development, I don't just mean developers. I was a sysadmin for years. Sometimes I want to create new infrastructure. I want to do more creating of whatever it is that I'm building. That's new work as well. I don't want to have to keep fixing the stuff that I've done before. This was the part that matters so much to me. It also helps us make our work better. It contributes to happier people. Because we don't just want to burn out all the time. The thing I love is that the promise of DevOps makes work better. It decreases burnout. And by the way, burnout isn't just being tired. Burnout is when we don't love what we used to love anymore about our work. Making smart investments in tech and process actually combats this. It also helps decrease deploy pain. That's like that panic when you push into prod and you're like, please just work. You know that awful meme that's hilarious, but it's funny because it's true with like the girl in the burning house. Worked fine in dev, ops problem now. <laughs> It helps get rid of that. Also gives us better job satisfaction. And when I say job satisfaction, our research into job satisfaction wasn't just I like my work, it's my work makes good use of my skills and abilities. And I have the tools I need to do my job. So it's like I get to do dope stuff. We also see higher net promoter score from employees. So they love what they do and they tell everyone else about it and a better organizational culture. Speaking of, I keep saying org culture. Who here has a definition of org culture? Who here has like three org definitions of org culture? Who here is sick of raising their hand? <laughs> okay. We always talk about organizational culture when we talk about DevOps, and I think it's because for years we were doing this technology thing and promising it would make a difference. And to be frank, it never did. And when I started doing this research, um, people told me I was crazy. I actually almost got kicked out of my PhD program. Because for 40 years, we had research showing that investments in technology didn't matter. Have we all heard this whole, like, IT is a cost center? That sucks. But here's why. It was because we used to just, like, buy tech and then walk away and expect, like, the magical fairy to show up. The problem is that if anyone else can just buy tech and walk away and do nothing else, that doesn't make you magically better than all of your competitors. It doesn't help you make things awesome for your customer or your end user. What we have to do is we have to find ways to differentiate ourselves. And that requires technology and process and culture and people. And then the magical fairy shows up. And so culture is really, really important because that's what allows people who are fundamentally different and diverse in background and technology and, and skill set to talk together and make these incredibly complex, diverse, distributed systems work in these ways that we've never seen before. And so when we started doing this work, we reached back into some of the other literature and found this great research by a sociologist named Ron Westrom. Now, he was doing research into high-risk complex systems 
where if something breaks, real bad things happen. So I'm talking healthcare, nuclear power, aviation. <laughs> Notice that there, when things, bad things happen, people die, like immediately. Now to be fair, <laughs> that's also kind of true in tech, right? Because we're also working in systems that power healthcare and aviation and these very, very high risk systems. I remember pushing into prod and we almost had to evacuate an ICU when a backup failed and it failed horribly. So we've also had these situations happen where something bad happens and our stomach's not. So this organizational culture maps up to so much of what we see when we talk about having a culture that values information flow and transparency and learning from failure and bridging across silos. And so when we found this, we were like, this might be a great way to talk about and measure and think about a DevOps culture, right? Is this kind of resonating? Okay, so let's look about the path, at the pathological one, power-oriented. It's typified by low cooperation. We shoot the messenger. We don't want to hear bad news. Responsibilities are shirked. Bridging is discouraged. Failure scapegoating, novelty is crushed. Okay, who here has a friend that works here? <laughs> okay, a couple of friends here. Uh, across our research, we've seen, I want to say, about 25, 30% fall here. And it's highly correlated with low performers. Bureaucratic is very rule-oriented. Now, to be fair, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Bureaucratic cultures are meant to optimize for fairness, okay? Modest cooperation among these very, very different teams. Messengers are neglected. If someone brings me, brings me bad news, I just kind of ignore it. I don't want to hear it, la, la, la. Narrowly defined responsibilities. Bridging's tolerated. Failure leads to justice. Novelty leads to problems. Who here has a friend? The works here? Okay, we've got some hands. I want to say about 55% of respondents hit here, and it's highly correlated with medium performers. What do you mean by bridging? Bridging. Oh, when we bridge across teams, so like dev, bridges to ops, bridges to testing, or even bridges to something like marketing. Oh, the question was, what do I mean by bridging? Okay. Um, now, the final one, generative or performance-oriented culture. High cooperation. High cooperation among teams that, that are like traditionally very different. Messengers are trained. So what do I mean by this? I, I want people to bring me bad news because then when I know it, then I can fix it. Risks are shared. Bridging's encouraged. Failure leads to inquiry. When I read that, I think of blameless postmortems, right? And then novelty is implemented. Who here has a friend or is lucky enough to work somewhere like this? Who here has no friends? <laughs> I love this because it mirrors some of the research done by Google's teams a few years ago from Project Aristotle. The background to some of this research was they were wondering what would make the perfect team. And I, if I recall correctly, I want to say the hypothesis moving into this was that the perfect team would have the perfect mix of skills, like technical skills. What they found instead was that the number one driver was psychological safety. They feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other, followed by dependability, structure and clarity, meaning and impact. It comes down to team dynamics. It comes down to the culture. That's what really drives impacts in teams. And I think it's particularly interesting because as I refer back to Westrom's organizational culture, the thing that was particularly interesting is in addition to defining and predicting outcomes, it also helped explain what happens when things go wrong. <laughs> How often do systems fail? All the time. Because we're working with highly, highly complex systems. So what else we see is that Failure in these complex systems will always happen. There's no way to guarantee against all failure. So 
in these systems, we often see that human error is the starting point. And so when we do blameless postmortems, we want to understand where to move forward. So how can we get people better information? And then how can we detect and limit failure modes? How can we build our systems better? I love this, this picture and this example. Um, Rin Daniels was at Etsy for a while. Um, has, is anyone familiar with this story? This story is dope. So at Etsy, they actually reward people for finding fantastic failures in the system. And why is this? It's because you have uncovered an opportunity to build more resiliency into the system. So Rin here was awarded the three-armed sweater. Are, are we familiar with Etsy? Etsy is a, is a marketplace where users can sell their, their handmade goods. One of their users knitted them a three-armed sweater. And so every year they have um, an award show, and, and Rin writes about this on their blog, and it's on failure and resilience. And, and it really is an honor. The, and it's very unintentional, but the, the better you can kind of bring down the system, it uncovers fantastic opportunities for them. And so this is where, where Rin wins and is awarded the three-armed sweater. And, and Kripa Krishnan talks about this at, at uh, cloud operations. For DIRT operations, so DIRT is disaster resilience testing. For DIRT-style events to be successful, an organization first needs to accept system and process failures as a means of learning. Remember back how learning was an opportunity, or failure was an opportunity to learn? We design tests that require engineers from several groups who might not normally work together to interact with each other. That way, should a real large-scale disaster ever strike, these people will already have strong working relationships. I love that as well, right? Bridging across teams, breaking down silos. So in conclusion, direction matters more than maturity. I know everyone loves to benchmark themselves against where they are and know what level we're on, but we always need to keep getting better. What happens if we get to level five and a few years later, suddenly the industry has magically decided that we get to a level eight? We just need to keep moving forward and getting better. Second, we can have it all, or at least speed and stability. DevOps culture and practices have a measurable impact on performance, quality, and culture. And culture can be measured and changed. One more plug. If any of this research or information was interesting to you at all, the data collection for the 2019 State of DevOps report is open right now and, is, and will be open until May 3rd.